Yeah, moving on to the biology of influenza viruses, uh, I guess I can give you um, uh, the bad news and also the good news. The bad news is I'm not a virologist, and specifically I'm not an influenza uh, a microbial biologist. Uh, the good news is I'm not a virologist. Uh, this is a uh, kind of a cartoon depiction of the swine flu virus, and this just shows you the lineage of the current H1N1 strain, uh, but there only are eight genes. Right? Uh, so this is a very simplistic organism compared with the 30,000 genes uh, in humans, uh, but it manages to do a great deal of damage. So we talked about uh, influenza, and now we're, we're still kind of influenza in general, not necessarily the swine flu. Uh, and what happens is, as people become immune, as a lot of cases go around and people are immune, the frequency of that particular strain of influenza dies down in the community. And you have an endemic number of cases. Every year there's some cases of influenza. It's probably in people who were just recently born or have never been exposed to it. Periodically there are epidemics where you see a larger number of cases. Uh, and a couple of times a century, there's a pandemic, a widespread uh, number of infections, uh, a lot of strain on the healthcare system. Uh, and that's about two or three times per hundred years. And I'm just skipping to the bottom, the last pandemic was 1957. The last epidemic was 1968, technically, I think. And a couple of years ago, there were, there were a fair number of cases. But according to the World Health Organization, they've already declared this year a pandemic year for swine flu. Now the endemic or baseline cases in the United States are up to 15 to 20 percent of the population. So if we have 300 million people, that's about 60 million cases per year. We don't have an exact count because you know people don't report every case of the flu. You certainly don't test for every case of the flu. But by looking at absenteeism from work or uh, school or hospital admissions, emergency room uh, visits, you can get an idea of how many cases, and there are a lot. And of course, we can count uh, hospital admissions, 200,000 a year on average, year in, year out, and 36,000 deaths year in, year out. Usually not from the flu, though it can be influenza, pneumonia, or overwhelming infection, but usually from complications, bacterial pneumonia, complicating influenza. Uh, seasonality, all of you know that the flu around here occurs in the wintertime. Why? Because this particular, the influenza virus, survives better <clears throat> in cold, dry air. And so in the summertime, when it's hot and humid, we don't see very much uh, influenza. The seasons are reversed, of course, in the southern hemisphere, so occasionally we see cruise ship passengers who are in Chile or Buenos Aires and come back and they have influenza because that's flu season in the wintertime. Our June, July, and August is wintertime down there. Now, swine flu never completely left us. It was present, uh, they did numbers from 1958 to 2005, and they found 37 proven cases. Right? Now, I don't think that includes the Fort Dix cases, obviously, uh, but the majority of those cases were sporadic and were, were from pig exposure, people who did pig farming or, or dealt animals, slaughterhouses. Uh, but 17% of them died, so that's just kind of a background number. There, an awful lot, there have been an awful lot of number of cases of in regular influenza, which I'll refer to as regular influenza, but very few cases of swine flu uh, since 1976. And this just gives you a feel for it. You can see this is 2005, 2009. Uh, um, week one is January, the week of January 1st. Uh, you can see that. Um, this is kind of January, February, and here, the number of cases peaks, it goes down to its bottom in the summer, and it goes back again. And in 2008, the number of cases, at least in these cities, uh, rose high enough that you could say, well, it's more than just endemic, it's approaching probably a small epidemic. And this shows you that uh, the Spanish influenza was H1N1, the Hong Kong flu was H2, Asian influenza, the Beijing flu was H3, then there was the Russian influenza. Uh, influenza B has been present throughout, uh, and there's some other cases here. Uh, avian influenza, I think, is H5N1. And so there's always a mix of cases every year. Now, the clinical presentation of influenza is pretty straightforward, and many of you have had influenza. 
It's fever, high fevers, 103, 104. Muscle aches, and these are muscle aches to beat the band. People say, oh, I couldn't move. I couldn't get out of bed. I hurt all over. So it's more than the run-of-the-mill summer cold virus. It's headaches, sometimes severe, though usually not to the level of meningitis. Runny nose, cough, and the cough is usually non-productive. When we start seeing cloudy, copious phlegm, we think about bacterial infection. Now, you can start off with influenza. It can set you up for a bacterial bronchitis or pneumonia, and then you can have that phlegm. But the influenza virus itself, even if there's influenza and pneumonia, usually leads to a non-productive call. The duration of illness is roughly a week. I've seen some healthy people bounce back in four or five days. A lot of people I know feel kind of crummy for a week. And we feel they're contagious until that week has gone by and the, your body is making its own antibodies to contain the virus. Uh, and the other thing is, if you've been on an effective, and you should underscore effective, because some of our antiviral agents are not as good as they used to be. But if you've been on effective antiviral therapy, such as Tamiflu or Lulenza, uh, for five days, generally the, we allow people to come out of respiratory isolation in the hospital. However, <coughs> convalescence can take several weeks, and people who really get knocked down by the flu are going to feel kind of uh, crummy and not really back to themselves for two or three weeks. The diagnosis is clinical. Most of the time in the flu season, we don't test for it. Somebody comes in in the middle of flu season, and you know there have been cases in the community, there have been cases in the schools, there have been cases in that patient's family, and they have all the hallmarks of influenza. You say, hey, you've got influenza, and we treat presumptively. Uh, you can also do nasal antigen testing. It's a swab. You send it. Most hospitals can do influenza A and B antigens. However, however, it, Testing for H1N1 subtype is not widespread. That's really something that uh, state laboratories or the CDC does. It was kind of an interesting uh, story there. What happened this summer was we were seeing a lot of cases of swine flu. And I'll give you numbers later on. And uh, what we would do is when somebody came into the emergency department with these symptoms, we'd get a nasal swab, send it to the hospital laboratory. They'd come back in an hour or two hours, three hours. Uh, yes, it's influenza A, yes, it's influenza B, no, it's neither. At that point, we would get a second swab and send it to the state, and the state would come back in three or four days saying, yes, this is, influ this is swine flu or it's not swine flu. And so if you had influenza A, uh, you would assume it's uh, swine flu and send it off for the lack of confirmation. And it was important to at least know it was type A because you could treat that with Tamiflu. Toward the middle of the summer, the state lab said, don't send us any more swabs because we're going to assume that in this area, where there's no regular influenza during the summer, any influenza you, A you see is going to be the swine flu. The differential diagnosis is other viruses. There are a lot of enteroviruses, and sore throats, and fever, and muscle aches. But by and large, they're not as severe. They can be, though, and it's important probably to test the flu in those severe cases. Uh, if pneumonia is suspected, uh, an x-ray should be done. Supportive care is rest, antipyretics, Tylenol is probably fine, ibuprofen is fine. You should not use aspirin, particularly in children, because there's a complicating condition called Rye syndrome with neurologic problems in some children, rare, who've had influenza who were treated with aspirin. And the complications are viral and bacterial pneumonia and, and severe muscle aches, myositis, especially in, in young children. And this just shows you an x-ray, this portion of the x-ray should be pretty much clear, and this shows a, a, a low bar pneumonia, which uh, probably is not influenza, because influenza gives you a diffuse appearance, but it could be a bacterial infection complicating influenza. Now, let me kind of branch off, and I want to say up front, this is not about an influenza. A SARS is usually a coronavirus, and there was some debate for a while whether it was a meta-pneumonia virus or a coronavirus. Uh, but because it was a serious outbreak that spread from uh, southern China to Vietnam to Singapore to Canada and around the world with a lot of deaths, uh, I want to examine that very briefly so you get a feel for what kind of damage can occur when you have a rapidly spreading pandemic that kills people. Now, I don't know if you remember this week uh, in 2003, but uh, the uh, Time Newsweek here, uh, and 
U.S. News and World Report all ran pictures on people in respirator masks. My favorite actually was this one, <laughs> which talked about uh, the SARS virus and how much damage it could do to the Chinese economy. But what happened with SARS was in November 2002 in southeastern China, uh, there, there was a severe case of pneumonia, viral pneumonia, in a, in a relatively young, healthy man. And the CDC and the WHO <coughs> maintained watch stations in Southeast Asia. And the reason, and we'll kind of, again, this does uh, bear on swine flu, the reason the people are watching there is the new strains tend to arise out of Beijing or Thailand or uh, areas like that, in part because the population densities are high. Uh, people, some people live in close proximity to animals. You might have situations with villagers living in, in a hut with animals kept immediately under the hut. Uh, and so that's where the surveillance goes on. And these cases spread, and Dr. Carlo Urbani, who was, I think, in his late 50s, a senior uh, clinician with the World Health Organization, he got wind of this, and he went to Vietnam to investigate. Now, he could have sent a junior staffer, he could have corresponded by email. He thought it was serious enough to go, he said, something's up. This is a case that it is not, it should not have happened. We've got to be concerned about a new viral threat uh, after he reported it, about five weeks later, he got sick and died. And there was talk for a time of naming the SARS virus the Urbani virus. Now, as you know, people in China and Vietnam will travel to Singapore. Uh, people in southern China will go to Vancouver. There's large Chinese populations in Toronto. Uh, and it spread very, very quickly. In fact, uh, they identified it as a coronavirus. Some individuals were found to be super spreaders, leading to hundreds of secondary cases. And the, the virus was able to survive for a long time on inanimate surfaces. A day, on average, up to four days, a, a cracked sewer pipe in the original apartment building in southern China, and the virus was able to survive for about four days. So uh, people went to quarantine, and there were a lot of problems with that. Air travel was disrupted. Um, you know, there was a warning that Actually, uh, the U.S. State Department said, don't go to Canada, uh, which very much upset the Canadians. Um, we were actually very lucky. We had a few cases, but many fewer than in Vancouver or Toronto. Uh, and they think that in Singapore, the, the very presence of SARS knocked about half to 1% off the gross domestic product. And that was, that's probably 50, well, five to $10 billion dollars. For, for Singapore. Um, I think my computer keeps trying to do something here. Now, there was also a personal impact. And what happened was, for example, in China, and I was talking with colleagues over there, and nurses or young doctors who worked in the hospitals often lived, or their aged parents lived with them. And their parents would beg them not to go to work because they were afraid they would bring SARS home and everybody would die. And that puts you in a terrible dilemma. You know, if you're uh, sworn to take care of patients, and yet your parents are asking you not to go to work, what do you do? I talked to colleagues in Toronto, and they said, well, you know, what they did was they made every hospital independent. Uh, people could only pick one hospital, and nurses and technicians and physicians would only go to that one hospital uh, during the duration of the epidemic. Now, the problem is, uh, on weekends, I cover two hospitals. Some physicians I know cover six hospitals. I know nurses who work in pools, and they might work at Lankanau, Paoli Hospital, Bryn Mawr, depending on where the need is. And they were told, no, you pick one hospital, and that's the only one you go to. And a lot of people, even though you were taking care of fewer patients, you were going in every week, day after day after day. So these are some of the things we saw with the SARS outbreak. There's been very little SARS, but it's a very contagious virus. Uh, there are cases of people becoming infected when they're taking off their gloves and gowns and masks. Uh, and, and there are still cases of SARS, but most of them occur in research centers where they're studying the virus. Uh, by the way, I was in uh, lecturing in Thailand around that time. Uh, I did take a, a mask with me, and I'll tell you a little bit more about respirator masks. But here I am in one of the temples. Posing with this guy who I'm informed was uh, Buddha's doctor, so he must have been a pretty good physician. 
Uh, this, by the way, is uh, not a hospital. This is the Singapore airport. And what happened there was they took major precautions. Even now, and I think this is true at Philly International, uh, what they wound up doing was putting a thermal scanner. So as you get off the plane, if your forehead registered more than and the number is classified, let's say 100.4, uh, you get pulled out of line and questioned. And in China, when the swine flu epidemic was getting going, if you had a fever, you went into quarantine. You know, four people went over there for a, a 10 day you know, vacation and spent the whole 10 days in one hotel room because they were suspected of having uh, swine flu. In fact, the Chinese cases were imported from the United States. Uh, and of course, uh, you can always try to make a profit here. Uh, this is um, uh, actually Vancouver. And these are not the good masks. These are the masks that cost about less than a dollar, and they were selling them for $10 a piece. Now, a quick word on masks. All masks are not created equal. The paper mask or even the thin plastic mask does not filter out the majority of uh, respirator particles. And you really want particles that are uh, small but not infinitesimally tiny because those are the ones that get deep down into the lungs and don't come back out. And so the paper masks don't do a good job. Uh, what you want is an N95 respirator mask which filters out 95% of these tiny particles. And those are very expensive masks. I think they're about $20 to $30 a piece in Tokyo, where they wear them as a fashion statement and also as a kind of a social responsibility statement. The other problem with masks, to be honest, is that they're probably good for a short time, minutes to a half an hour, but then they become saturated with moisture. You start breathing around them, uh, and they really are not a long-term fix. So I'll be honest, when I fly, I carry a couple of N95 masks with me, and the person ahead of me is coughing their lungs out, and I'm going to put it on. Now, another trip, this is a, another virus. This is, I think, the H5N1. Uh, and this is the avian influenza. Uh, and yes, you can swab birds for uh, bird flu. The bird flu's been around forever. In fact, the New Yorker uh, suggests that this is one way to identify a chicken uh, with avian flu. <coughs> Now, so what's the big deal about bird flu? Uh, well, avian influenza has been around for a long time, decades. Uh, over 10 years ago, Hong Kong had an outbreak with six deaths, I think. And Hong Kong has been extremely efficient. Their response was to kill every chicken uh, in Hong Kong in one week, six million birds. And they were able to stop the epidemic in its tracks. Uh, later on in 2004, uh, avi avian flu was reported in eight Asian countries, uh, 44 cases, 32 deaths. Most of these were people who had close contact with birds, poultry farmers, people who ran uh, meat markets, for example. But in Thailand in 2004, uh, there was a cluster of cases uh, that were probably person to person. Somebody came from the city to nurse a farmer who had gotten bird flu, and that person came down with avian flu, never having come in contact with chickens or ducks or whatever. Uh, again, there was uh, a lot of concern. Uh, flocks were looked at. If there was any question at all, entire flocks were called. Uh, people, I think the WHO suggested to each member of the nation they stockpile enough tammy food for 25% of their population. So that was mil tens of millions of doses from those countries. And the problem is tammy food has an expiration date. You can't keep it indefinitely. So people were spending tens of millions of dollars for any food. Uh, and vaccines were developed. The Chinese have a vaccine, but it's been held in reserve. And the plan was, if there's an outbreak, everybody for 10 miles or 50 miles around the outbreak will be vaccinated. Uh, so SARS has been a, uh, I'm sorry, so avian flu has been a big concern, uh, just as SARS was shortly before. Uh, and the reason bird flu is concerned was the, the feeling is that here you've got the outbreaks in Vietnam, uh, China, uh, down towards Singapore, Indonesia, and the birds here migrate to East Asia and mix with flocks that come from the rest of the world, including North America. And so the concern was this would become a worldwide pandemic, but fortunately it has not. 
they did do very rigorous quarantine, and, and this kind of sheds some light on human nature because we're going to revisit the issue of quarantine on uh, college campuses, uh, in hospitals, and so forth. But I think it was in Albania they had their first case of bird flu, and the government was very serious. They sent the army to surround this village with barricades. And to get in and out of the village, you had to walk through a trench that was lined with a tarp that had disinfectant. The idea being, if you carried soil or bird flu on your shoes, it would kill off all the bird flu. And so an older man, an elderly man, uh, was coming out of the village, and he dutifully walked through the trench with a lot of splashing, which upset the chicken that he was hiding under his coat, who then <laughs> got up and flew away. So human beings, unfortunately, are our own worst enemy. Uh, this is what they talked about precautions with the bird flu. Uh, you can eat birds as long as they're cooked. There actually were some cases of bird flu associated uh, with drinking, I think, uncooked duck's blood. Get your vaccination. Now, there was no uh, bird flu vaccine, but the idea was to take the regular flu vaccine so you were less likely to get the flu-like syndrome so they wouldn't have to worry if you had the bird flu or not. And again, we're going to revisit that issue with swine flu and regular flu. Don't pour drugs. People are trying to stock up on Tamiflu just in case. Stay away from animal markets. Wash your hands. Call your doctor. Uh, and then so forth. So we'll, we'll kind of revisit some of these issues. Now, finally moving on to influenza treatment and prevention. Uh, there's a quote, uh, when you're up to your ass in alligators, it's difficult to remember the original objective was to drain the swamp. And so if you wind up in the middle of an epidemic, it's nice to have thought about things first and said, okay, this is what I'm going to do to prepare myself. This is what I'm going to do to try to prevent it. This is what we're going to, this will be what I'll do if I get sick. So influenza vaccines, year after year, are usually a mix of three A and B strains. Recently, it's been two A strains and one B strain. In fact, one of the strains last year was an H1N1 strain, but it was not similar to the swine flu strain, which had a lot of other antigens. So it does not protect you from that. It makes the terminology confusing. Most viruses are killed injectable, the classic flu shot in the arm. There is a live uh, flu vaccine called flu mist that you spray in the nose. It actually may be a little, it's counted as being a little more effective, but it's more expensive. And it's more effective because the virus replicates and you get a better immune response. However, you can also become a little bit sick from it, and it's not recommended for pregnant women, immunocompromised patients, cancer patients, because of that possibility of getting vaccine strain disease. Vaccines are 80 to 90 percent protective. That means you're not 100% protected. There's a 1 out of 10 to 2 out of 10 chance you'll get the flu, but often it's going to be much milder. The immunity takes 10 to 14 days to build, maybe a week, but probably 10 to 14 days. And then it peaks at 6 to 8 weeks. So what we've been used to doing is recommending the flu vaccine around, I've always said Halloween. It's kind of been my marker, or before Halloween. And that way, if you get it in October, you start to build October uh, immunity in November. You're peaking at the end of December or January where it kind of hits here, and then you're the best protected you could get. But we've had problems. There have been delays in vaccine availability. Sometimes they run out early. We've, had been, we've been in the embarrassing situation of having our practice run out, but having the Walmart or the local drugstore having bought, the company having bought millions of doses early in the year still having it. So we can't get it for our 90-year-olds, but anybody can walk into Walmart and get the vaccination. Uh, but, and the other problem we run into is a lot of people have been resistant to taking the flu vaccine. I don't need it. I'm worried about getting side effects. Uh, every time I get the vaccine, I get the flu, et cetera, et cetera. And this just shows you a situation from about three or four years ago when we were in the middle of the gas shortage, and an old patient said, I'll trade a gallon of gas for a flu shot. It actually almost was that bad. Now, what besides vaccines, we have drugs that treat the flu now. Uh, this is a, a schematic that shows you what happens with <coughs> drugs like Tamiflu and Relenza uh, prevent the virus from budding out of an infected cell. It doesn't protect that, it doesn't cure that infected cell. That cell is probably going to go on and die. However, it keeps the virus from getting out of it, so it prevents it from spreading to healthy tissue. 
and as a result, you don't cure patients, but you keep them from being sick for as long. And it's, I generally tell people, well, this will take 40% off the duration. If you're going to be sick for seven days, maybe you'll be sick for five days, four or five days. In addition, you really need to use it early before the virus is established. So the official recommendation is starting within 48 hours of symptom onset. I will use it after 72 or 96 hours and tell patients it might not work as well. But I've had some remarkable recoveries even using it the four-day point. Uh, originally, we used amantadine or rimantadine. Some of these drugs are used for uh, Parkinson's disease, and they have interesting side effects. They have nausea, they have dizziness, they have muscle issues. Uh, so we didn't use it that much, and they were only effective against influenza A. So if you had a year when a lot of the cases were influenza B, you were out of luck. Recently, uh, oseltamivir or Tamiflu became available. Um, I think it's been out really about 10 years now. The Relenza is an inhaled powder, which is more difficult to use because you have to inhale this powder. Uh, but they're effective against both influenza A and influenza B. And you can also use it prophylactically. Let's say classic example is a nursing home. There's a two-bedded room. One of the individuals gets uh, the influenza. You know, the roommate may be a refused flu vaccine for whatever reason. You start the roommate on half-dose Tamiflu for 10 days and give them a vaccination at the beginning, and hopefully the Tamiflu will prevent them from getting sick until the vaccine has a chance to, to build immunity. Uh, but during the last flu season, about 40% of the regular flu, influenza A, not B, influenza A was resistant to Tamiflu. And this meant that in the emergency department, we had to quickly scramble, and the approach was either to give Tamiflu plus one of the older drugs, Relenza, I'm sorry, uh, amantadine or rimantadine, or convince people to use the inhaled powder, which was effective against both. So far, H1N1 swine flu has been susceptible to tammy flu. That's the good news. There are a few cases around the world where it's not susceptible. And if that becomes a big trend, uh, then we are in trouble. So in the pharmacy, uh, there are hopefully new releases, but nothing in the pipeline for this year as far as flu drugs. We're still fighting the battle to try to get to people to accept the flu vaccine. Uh, Mr. I don't believe in flu shots is here. Uh, and we've also tried to push it for children here. Gary Larson has an example uh, of uh, how to increase vaccination among kids. Now, so finally, we're on our last topic, uh, which is what does the future hold? Uh, and Yogi Berra. Yogi Berra used to say things like, uh, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. He also said, making predictions is difficult, especially when they concern the future. Now, one of the problems with having your microorganisms become resistant to your uh, vaccines, it's like being out on safari in Africa, and these people are surrounded by big cats, and the punchline is, drive, this one's got a coat hanger. So if your flu vaccine is no longer going to protect you, you have to worry about a widespread pandemic. Another example is a lion tamer with a chair and a gun, also surrounded by big cats. And the punchline is he's firing blanks, pass it on. So what do you do if you're all set with your Tammy flu and you know you're going to go to the doctor and get Tammy flu as soon as the first sign of the flu, and there's a 40% chance the flu is resistant to Tammy flu. I want to show you what it really looks like. Uh, I was in Botswana two years ago with my younger daughter, and we were out on safari. This was the, the first day of safari. And our guide was explaining to us how we'd be out on game drive, looking for elephants and giraffes and, and uh, ungulates. And if we were lucky, we might see uh, a predator, like a lion, or a leopard, or a cheetah. And I'm there staring off in the distance. I said, well, isn't that a lion out there 300 yards? And he said, yes, it is. And he drove us up to it. This is what it looks like close up. Uh, what you have to know is that when the game has been acclimated to vehicles, they don't consider the vehicles with people in them threatening uh, or edible, which is very important. <laughs> and I'm having all of my business cards changed to infectious disease consultant and game spotter. <laughs> now, so we're back to H1N1 flu, uh, and it shows you that there's an assortment of genes from the classic swine flu, a human strain, a bird strain, a Eurasian swine strain, 
So it's really a mix, and it's made it very, very infectious. Uh, this is a busy slide, and I apologize for it. What it is is the CDC got very fancy and showed that here we were seeing the flu season. This was about uh, February uh, 2009. And you see there were a lot of cases. The cases were peaking, and these were the B strains. These were the A strains. These were specific A strains, and A type H1. <coughs> and sure enough, right on schedule, it starts to go down. But what happened is, as you got down to March and April, you started to see these strains, which are different in color from these. And these were the swine flu. And these were the ones reported in Mexico where there were, I think, um, about 1,000 cases initially, ultimately 10,000, and about 15% deaths. And these spread to the United States, across the border, into California and Texas, and by air all around the country. Uh, and pretty soon you see that the, right here, probably April, May, uh, the regular flu strains, which are here, are almost gone, and almost everything is swine flu. So swine flu is officially SOIV, swine origin influenza virus. Very few people now are immune. And if you were around in 1918 and had the flu, you probably are immune. In Fort Dix, it was successfully quarantined, but the vaccine was kind of a, a well, we didn't need it. We didn't know it at the time. And it was concerned about Guillain-Barre syndrome. The outbreak in Mexico scared everybody, kind of wrecked the tourist industry in Mexico for a while. And it appears to be more contagious than the regular strain. It's hard to judge this, but in regular flu, um, about 5 to 15 percent of people who are exposed to that individual will come down. With swine, swine flu, it's more like 22 to 33 percent. There have been over 100,000 cases worldwide. There are 43,000 cases uh, in the U.S., and that's as of the end of July. They stopped counting. They stopped testing specifically for swine flu, so it's higher than that now. So there already are more cases than we see at peak most years. Uh, almost 8,000 people were hospitalized and 119 died. The good news, I suppose, if there can be any good news in, in over 100 deaths, was that the people who died had immune problems, largely. Now, some were very sad. Pregnancy, which is a relative immunity. Asthma, which renders you more susceptible to lung infections. And there have been fewer, at least in the United States, fewer healthy people. Uh, and the question is, what's going to happen this month, or next month, or January, or February? And fortunately, uh, Tamiflu or Oseltamivir is still effective. Now, what about the vaccine? Because we're now getting into uh, issues and decisions that will affect each one of us. Um, remember I told you we normally take the regular flu vaccine in October, or even November. And now the push is on to get people to take the regular vaccine now to kind of clear the decks for the swine flu vaccine. The target flu of the swine flu vaccine, and here's the problem. Uh, ideally, the government would like to vaccinate 300 million Americans. But there are probably only going to be 50 or 60 million doses of swine flu vaccine available for this country by October. And so the uh, uh, priority list of pregnant women household contacts of infants, uh, kids, six to 24, six months to 24 years, so you're talking about almost everybody, or many of the students on this campus, adults under 65 with medical conditions, uh, and healthcare workers. And then we're going to be, you know, my feeling about Jean Bure is I do want to see some of the preliminary safety data, and that's one of the things that's holding up the release of the swine flu vaccine. Uh, but I think Jean Bure is going to be highly unlikely because of advances in vaccine technology compared with 30 years ago. Thimerosal is a preservative. I don't, the rumor was that the vaccine would not be available in single dose vials where you could get away without preservative because presumably it's going to be refrigerated and used once. If you have a multi-dose vial which is easier to produce, you do need to put a preservative in it. And there are some people who are very worried about thimerosal. My feeling is it's an issue if you have a proven allergy. Tamiflu is still effective. We're asking people not to hoard it. Now, personal hygiene is critical. This is where being a little paranoid or even a lot of paranoid is probably a good thing. Uh, don't come to work uh, sick. You know, we've had these signs up since the spring. 
if you're not feeling well, you have the symptoms of the flu, you're exposed to the flu, do your, uh, your friend a favor, don't come and visit them in the hospital. Uh, control coughing and sneezing. Most influenza is spread by droplets from coughing and sneezing. You can get it by touching the surface. And for example, if you touch, if you shook hands with somebody who coughed in their hand, or you touched something with a utensil that they had contaminated, and then you rubbed your eye or bit your nails, yeah, you could come down with influenza, but you're more likely to get it from somebody sneezing around you. We've already talked about the limitations of masks. Uh, but for heaven's sakes, do your best to avoid people who are coughing and sneezing and do the hand washing of the alcohol-based hand sanitizer. I'm going to kind of leave a few minutes for questions, uh, but some questions that I have are, are we as health professionals ready for the onslaught of phone calls and visits? Uh, are we going to be able to make a rapid diagnosis? Because if somebody tells me they have the flu, one of my questions is going to be the regular flu or the swine flu because the regular flu may not be as well treated with Tamiflu. Now that leads us to the treatment decision issue uh, and quarantine. Uh, the, one of the universities in Seattle has already had 2,200 cases of swine flu among their students. I'm told that at Emory University down south and in the south, they start somewhat earlier, uh, they've had more cases. Uh, one of the empty dorms was converted into a swine flu dorm. The students have nicknamed it Swine U. And every, all the cases of swine flu, I mean, you can't, you have a limited number of cases in the infirmary, they've all been checked into the, the empty dorm uh, to wait out the, the episode of influenza. Uh, and in some cases, there have been summer camps or secondary schools that have been closed. This just shows you how to do effective hand washing, and basically, for a long time and be comprehensive. And I'm going to end with a number of cartoons, and we thought about doing this. One of the uh, casinos in Atlantic City reportedly tried something like this. They gave all of their employees badges with a magnetic strip and a, and a light, and if they didn't stand in front of a sink for 15 seconds after entering the bathroom on the hotel property, when they came out, the, the light would blink. Now, the trouble is it didn't mean you were washing your hands for 15 seconds, uh, but they gave up on it. Uh, we also are trying to discourage everybody from wanting tangy flu, including animals. Polly wants a flu shot. Uh, and then the situation we're in is it's like this. Thank God those blip blasted crickets have finally stopped. The question is why the crickets stop. So there's always something out there, whether it be SARS or avian flu or swine flu. But this time I think it's real. This time I think it is going to be a big problem. Hopefully, most of the illnesses will be behind <laughs> the panic of just a sore throat. And this last slide, take with a grain of salt. Uh, I actually tried to take off the editorial of comments, but this is a real thought provoker. All right? So my, my predictions are that there will be a lot of cases of swine flu, because there already have been. I'm hoping that most of them will be relatively benign. I think that people can protect themselves and their neighbors and their colleagues and their fellow students by controlling the cough, washing their hands, not showing up for class or work if they're clearly sick and probably contagious, and by judiciously, by taking the vaccine. Oh, I, I forgot to tell you, the swine flu vaccine, when it becomes available next month, so far in the U.S., they've been saying it's going to take two shots to get adequate immunity. And the a Chinese company and a European company claim that their vaccine with one shot gives you adequate titers for protection. So, but I would get the regular flu vaccine this month, I would get the swine flu vaccine when it comes out, and hopefully that, that way we'll be able to blunt the epidemic, if not, uh, not prevent it. Thank you very much for coming and listening.